if you would with me uh, go ahead and pull out your Bibles. And we're going to be in Galatians this morning uh, in here in the worship center. So if you'll turn in the New Testament to Galatians, we will find ourselves there uh, in Paul's letter as he wrote to the church in Galatia. And uh, man, what, a, what an awesome time of uh, worship as we, man, just singing God songs this morning. Amen? And, uh, and so it just prepares us. It gets our hearts uh, ready and in the right place as we dig into God's Word together. And, uh, and so we'll be in Galatians this morning doing that. While you're making your way there, let me just say, man, what a whirlwind of a summer uh, it has been. I mean, it just seems like school let out like last week or something. And, uh, and we have turned around, and it has been a super busy summer, but an awesome summer uh, at Crosshaven. I mean, we started off with VBS, and uh, let's give God the praise this morning. We had uh, several children who came to know Christ during Bible school, so let's praise God for that uh, this morning. And uh, we, uh, several of those kids have been baptized, and some others will be. And, and the impact on families with that, moms and dads got to come in here every night, and, and uh, a lot of folks that, that maybe were unchurched being able to hear the gospel. And uh, we, we turned around, we've had two teams uh, go out and serve in our partnership in New Mexico, um, out in Gallup in the Church Rock area. Had a team just return uh, this weekend, got back uh, they got back Friday uh, and just uh, serving, doing Bible school out there uh, at Church Rock with Creators Fellowship, with the McIntosh family and with the Sharptons. And uh, a lot of you know the Sharptons uh, from here, and we're going to miss them sorely, but the whole family has now moved out to New Mexico and are serving out there, and we still have our partnership, and we're going to be uh, partnering with them on, in, on an ongoing basis. Uh, we've had some folks... Uh, recently go to Peru, and uh, we uh, still are partnering there, uh, be praying for uh, Josh, my brother, and Crystal, my sister-in-law, and Isaac and Ella. Uh, they are uh, back in the United States right now, and will be here uh, uh, for a while uh, on, uh, on leave uh, from, with the IMB, uh, but we're still partnering there, so uh, they'll, they'll be with us in worship, and and man, we, uh, our student ministry had, the local, uh, had a local mission project just a couple of weeks ago. And man, what an awesome, awesome week. I feel like we're kind of just doing catch-up this Sunday. What an awesome week. Uh, you guys got to see uh, some highlights from that a couple of weeks ago. And what a, what a cool thing for our student ministry to plug in locally and serve the community. And I had so many people just tell me, man, how much that meant for our students to go to places like the nursing home in Hansville and to go down to City Hall and to the park and work there and to work on a, on a guy's house uh, that is connected with some folks here at Crosshaven and just to say, hey, we care about you and we want to pour in. They even did some work here on campus working in our nursery and doing some cleanup projects. And man, just uh, awesome for our student ministry, right? Um, to, you know, to take part. And we, you know, we give God our pantry ministry that's going on. We had one of our, uh, one of our college students go and serve in Roatan, Honduras with David and Greta Johns. Um, serving there for, for two weeks, you there two weeks, all right, two weeks uh, serving uh, there with them, and um, David and Greta are, are another family that were, were birthed out of this church and called uh, on to missions, and then we turn around last week, and you guys got to see the highlights, um, some of us are still in recovery mode from Centricid, man, if you've never been to Centricid, um, then I don't think you're a Christian. I mean, if you've never served as a chaperone, um, because, I mean, that will test your Christianity right there. Uh, but, but seriously, man, what an awesome weekend it was uh, uh, at Centra Kid and just some awesome leaders and awesome kids. Um, got to go and be a part of, of, of hearing the gospel and doing Bible studies and worshiping together. So we've turned around, and man, here we are, and summer's like school starting back next week or something. I mean, it's not really, but it's, I mean, it's, it has flown by, um, and, uh, and, and it's just good to, good to, good to kind of be back. Uh, Miles Newton, wherever you went, thank you for preaching last week. Doesn't Miles always do an awesome job uh, of sharing God's Word? And, uh, and so, Miles, thank you. Miles is, is, is on our staff and one of our elders uh, as well. And, and Miles has kind of taken on a new role uh, on our staff. He is kind of overseeing discipleship church-wide, but especially on the adult level. And I just want to challenge you. Um, 
when we talk about discipleship, to take advantage of the opportunities. Um, this is an awesome church. It's not a perfect church, but it's an awesome church. And there are a lot of great leaders who, are, who, who take time and invest in preparing to teach and, and help people get deeper in God's Word. And I just want to challenge you to take advantage of that. Um, Sunday mornings at 930, we have life groups and, and all the way from babies up through adults to come and get plugged into that. Can I shoot us straight? Can I, can I talk straight this morning? Look, if we can give time to get our kids involved and go, and, and, and I'm one of them, I, I, my kids are involved in a lot of things, but if we can, if we can set priorities on um, getting our kids involved in ball and cheerleading and all these other kind of things, but then we find it too hard to get our families involved in the most important things, then that's a spiritual problem. And so I just want to encourage you, your church is making opportunities for you. Come an hour earlier on Sunday and get plugged into a life group. Wednesday nights at 6.30, there are discipleship opportunities year-round from babies all the way through adults. I guess what I'm saying, I love you enough, I, as your pastor, I love you enough to just shoot straight. At the, when we stand before the Lord one day, you know, I think you know, we need to be able to say, we did more than raise great ball players and good cheerleaders. That we raised people to, to understand and know the depth of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and those aren't the only opportunities to do that. Um, but, but man, let's, let's make it a priority. Let's, let's dig into those things. Because there are people taking time in, in preparing these, the, the, these opportunities uh, to get involved in God's Word and to grow deeper and, and to fellowship together. Okay, so... Um, said all that, and we're in Galatians this morning, Galatians chapter 6. So if you would turn there with me, we're doing standalone messages this summer, and we're just kind of just asking the Lord to bring us what, uh, what He wants us to have, what He wants us to hear. And two weeks ago, um, when, I, when I preached, we, we preached a pretty straightforward message about sin and the effects of sin on our lives, and how to deal with that, even at the temptation stage, how to not make light of sin, how to, um, how to, to, to be honest. God already knows, but to be honest with ourselves and honest with others, that, that we all fall short, and, um, and, and we, are, we are very aware many times of, of, what, we, uh, of what we do. Uh, it reminds me, I've got, a, I've got a good friend, and we were going on vacation this week, and I was, somehow I was, uh, I, I sent him, a, we've been friends for a long time, I sent him a picture while we were gone, and we kind of had a laugh, and I thought about him, and he, tells, he told me of this time, uh, he lives in Orlando, and he had gone to one of these passion plays uh, at Easter time at the church that he was visiting when he first moved to Orlando, and um, and he said that it was the passion play, and Jesus was Jesus was dying on the cross in the in the play, and um, and and he said that that the, the man playing Jesus uh, said, "Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do." And they had a cast of people there that were like the the what the people that were watching the crucifixion scene. They were in the play, but they were extras, so they had just kind of gathered some people and put robes on them. And so Jesus says, "Forgive them, for they know what the, for they know not what they do." And he said there was one little Hispanic lady that was in the crowd in the in the play, and she she yelled out, "No, Jesus, we do know what we do!" Like that, real loud, like messed up the whole play. Like it was like the it was like the the focal point of the play. And, and, you know, we, we, are, we are all sinners, and deep down we know. We know that we fall short of the glory of God. We know what we do. And, and the Bible is very clear about sin. Uh, sin is us falling short. Sin is us being broken. Sin is, sin is us needing, knowing that we can't fix ourselves and that we need God uh, to, to fix it. Um, Paul, listen, we, uh, we had a very interesting vacation. It was a lot of fun, but it just seemed like the weather's all messed up down at the beach. And so I made this, let me, let me just preface this before you play it. So, so um, whatever afternoon this was, I think it was Thursday, um, no, Friday, we, the, the weather was supposed to be really bad. Well, we wake up that morning and all of a sudden it's beautiful outside. And so we go to the pool for a little while, and then, and then the wife says, hey, let's ride our bikes to go eat. So riding our bikes didn't mean like ride across the street. Riding our bikes to go eat meant like nearly four miles 
to go eat. And so we're, you know, we're, we're chugging along, and, and uh, we go down, and we eat. We, 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 we eat our lunch, and we're about to go back and get on the bikes and go back to the condo, which is another how many miles y'all talk to me? Three and a half there, so it's how, how far is it back? Let's see how good we are at math. Three and a half back. And uh, the bottom falls out. I mean, rainstorm, going, rain's pouring. And me being the, the awesome dad of awesomeness I am, I said, we're not, you know, uh, what was our slogan? It was YOLO, you only live once, let's go for it. And so we get on the bikes and we're heading back. And, and I mean, it's torrential downpour. Sharon and the kids take off and I'm kind of behind. And I'm on a rental bike and the seat breaks. Okay, and I'm, talking, I'm not talking about like comes loose. I'm talking about like the bolt that holds it on breaks in half. And so I am sitting, the, and, and I tell them to go on. I'll figure it out. I am sitting on a bike about this low, and I'm pedaling three and a half miles with my, my like, like that, and the seat is going back and forth. And so I'm just riding down the, down the road three and a half in a torrential rainstorm, and it was awful. So I, I stopped and made a little, let's, I'm trying to make a point with this. This is not just some random story. It's bad video quality, so. And I don't know if it's got any audio, but that's me stopped on the side of the road, and I'm, I'm pointing at it because I want to show the people, like, what's wrong. Like, there's no bolt. It's completely falling out. And I'm on a bridge, and then all of a sudden, I'm, like, calling for help with traffic going by. And then I make the point that this thing is absolutely broken. Okay, and so sin is like that. Sin causes brokenness, and it's something that we cannot fix. That bike had to go back to the shop, okay? And, and we, have to, we have to rely on Jesus Christ because of our sin. Um, and we're going to take it a step further this morning in talking about sin. So now we're going to talk about accountability. So... Let's talk about how we, as believers, how the church functions and how we deal with sin as we see it in other people's lives, how we make it our business as the church to hold people accountable without making it our business. In other words, we don't get trapped into um, doing the same things. Look at what Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5 says. It says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression... You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. But, here's the, here's the kicker in this. It says, but keep watch on yourself as you do this, lest you too be tempted. Okay, you see that? If anyone's caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. But keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. And so it's about accountability in the church. It's about making it your business. It's about approaching a brother or sister in Christ who's living in sin and saying to that person, God's got something better for you. God's got a better way for you. But doing it in the sense that you can help them and that you don't get caught up in those same things. And so we've all experienced someone getting in somebody else's business before, haven't we? This is where you shake your heads, yes, where people are nosy and they get in people's business. Um, the first time, this is my, I heard Miles kind of picked on Sharon last week while I was gone a little bit. And, uh, and so this is my Sunday once a month when my wife is teaching kids worship that I can, that I can use stories and that y'all can't tell her about. Um, the very first time I ever took Sharon home when we were dating, the very first time I ever took her home to meet my parents, let me tell you what I did. All right, I called my, I called my mother, uh, and not on a cell phone because people re didn't really have those back then. So I called my mother on the landline, and the kids are like, what's a landline? I called my mother, and I said, hey, can you take all the pictures of Terry down out of my room, which was my girlfriend before Sharon? I said, can you take them all down and stick them in a drawer? I'm bringing Sharon home to meet you, to meet y'all. And so we get there, and of course my room looks like nobody had lived there for years. Like all the pictures are down, and they're taken down, they're, they're put in the drawers. Um, and so that's the first time I, I take her home. Well, my wife, that little sneak, you know what she did? So 
so she, at some point in time, she went up to where my bedroom, like, excused herself, I need to go to the restroom or something, sneaks up to my room and finds all the pictures. And so we're on our way home after we eat dinner with them. She said, I found all those pictures of Terry in your, in your drawer. And I, I said, okay, well, great. Um, and I said, but, you know, but you know I love you because I had, had, had her take those pictures down, right? So we've all had somebody get in our business before, right? Be, be nosy. But, um, but that's not what we're talking about with this. We're talking about a biblical responsibility that the Scripture gives us uh, as believers to hold other believers uh, accountable, uh, to, to live the way that God really wants us to live. So let's begin to break down this Scripture. According to verse 1, if we look at this in Galatians chapter 6, uh, Paul is saying to the church at Galatia that there's someone who's caught in sin. And we've all been there, busted because of our sin. Uh, our, sin, our sin that we thought was hidden was brought to light. Now, you don't have to raise your hand and tell me what it was, but we've all been there, right? The sin we thought we were hiding, it's come to light. We're caught cheating, we're caught in a lie, we're caught um, whatever it may be, gossiping, looking at pornography, guilty, whatever it may be. The hidden sin is not hidden anymore. Um, it, it happens in marriages uh, it happens in financial schemes. People think they're getting by with something and then it's exposed. Um, it's, it's, it's revealed. It's backfired. People see through it. Um, the, the, the occasional drink turned to drunkenness or the quest to feel more important turned to flaunting and flirtation. Uh, the need for respect turned to an addiction, whatever, whatever it may be. Uh, the, the, the desire to... to, to push others to a point of perfection, turn to rebellion, whatever it is, guilty, busted, we've all been there. And if we claim that we've not, then, then we are, that in and of itself is sin. Now think about this. Um, we'll put this scripture on the screen. 1 John chapter 1, verse 10 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him, who's Him? Jesus Christ. We make God, we make Jesus a liar, and His Word is not in us. So we have to come to that point where we admit we are sinners. We have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all been busted because of our sin. And, and let me kind of give you a straight-up promise from God's Word. Here's the deal. You can't hide it for very long. You can't hide it for very long. Numbers, in, in the Old Testament, Numbers 32, 23 says this. This is pretty straightforward. It says, be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin will find you out. Moses was warning the people that their sin would find them out. According to God's Word, you can't really hide sin. You, you, you will know deep down at sin. People will find out eventually. But even more than that, God has already known, God does know, and God's going to know. But here's, what, here's what's awesome about God, though. God provides the source of forgiveness through Jesus Christ and hope that provides us a way out of the trap of a sinful lifestyle. And we find grace and mercy and hope in Jesus Christ. And so, there's a, this is pretty straightforward, but I think we have to enter into it with this understanding. And this is just, I guess this is just the simplest, simplest way I could make the quote. Um, and we'll put this on the screen. Here's what we got to do. If you're taking notes on your newsletter, we put it on there. You gotta quit. We got to quit hiding from God. We got to quit hiding from God. We too often try to hide our sin. But what we need to do is come clean, invite Jesus in, ask Him to clean us up. I'm going to get in trouble again. I did this with a junk drawer a few weeks ago. Um, I, I snapped a picture of our hall closet before I left. Um, and, and so don't tell my wife I put it on there. It's actually pretty neat right now. It's been a lot more junky than that, but it's got coats and beach towels and tennis bags all jammed in there, and it's, it's the closet. Everybody's got the junk closet, right, where you cram stuff, and then you close the door and act like it's not there so you can get everything cleaned up. And I think that we, we do that sometimes. We, we jam the sin in there. We try to hide it from God. And man, when you open the door, there it is. And, and the sin is there. Sin being brought to light, revealed for what it really is. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about coming clean when sin comes to life. And I think sometimes we, we begin to ask these questions. Go here with me for just a second. We, we can't expect for God to keep us from the consequences of sin when we're continuing to live in the sin. People a lot of times are asking, you know, why is God not blessing me? I'm a Christian, and I thought God would make my life easier 
after I became a Christian? Why is it so hard? Why is it so complicated? Why are things not going my way? Why are things not working out? And usually the answer is because if you're living in a sinful lifestyle, if you're choosing sin over Christ, can I shoot it straight again? God can't bless something that's dirty. God won't do that. Now, what happens when your sin catches up with you, what happens when you thought you were hiding something and then it's brought to light, is, and what should happen in the church is one, we're, we're convicted by it ourselves and we want to change, but what should happen in the church is that another Christian who loves you and cares about you should be man enough or woman enough and walking in the Spirit enough. We sang that in the last song. We invited the Holy Spirit and said, you are present in this place, but He's present in our lives. In the Spirit enough and living for God enough to call you on it. Read verse 1 again. Brothers, if anyone who is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And that's part of what the church should be. God called us as, as, among believers that, that as Christians, that we should be a community of faith, that we as the corporate church, that we are one in unity, we are bound together in Christ, aren't we? God's called us and mandated us to be accountable to Him and then be t- to be accountable to His Word together. So if you're a Christian and you're living in deep, continual sin and you get caught, someone calls you on it and says, hey, that's not the way of a believer. I love you enough to tell you that this needs to get straightened out and needs to change. Then don't get mad at the person because Paul tells us right here in Scripture that's what the church should do. It, don't think that it's nobody else's business and get mad because God already knows and God's mandated for the church to do that. I don't mean to, to, to sound so hard, but if you're, if you're doing that and you're living in that sin and you're saying, well, I don't care, I'm just going to live how I want to, you're hurting God's kingdom and it is the business of other believers who are protecting the kingdom of God and standing for what is right. Making it your business, but Paul adds to that. He says, but as we do that as the church, we have to make it our business without making it our business. In other words, without getting caught up in the same thing too, because there's that danger of when you go to somebody and you confront that person over a sin they're living in, you got to be markedly different and say, you don't need to go this way, and, then not, and you have to be careful not to get caught up in the same thing that they're caught in. We have the responsibility of going to our brothers and sisters in Christ when we see them in sin, to love people enough to be willing to do that. Um, I have learned in 23 years of ministry now that it's, that it's better to be straight up with people, to not beat around the bush. I've, I've had people do that with me as well. People come to me and say, hey, look, I see something in your life. I see something that, you know, that, that I want you to think about, that you need to... And so what I'm I'm trying to say as your pastor this morning that accountability in the body of Christ is a good thing. Do you agree with me? Accountability in the body of Christ is, is a good thing. I'd rather someone be honest with me if they see something in my life than to him haul around about it and me not even be aware of it. And I hope you would too. So Paul gives us some warning in that. We have the responsibility to do it the right way, to confront people in their sin. Um, Matthew, if you've got your Bibles, we'll put this on the screen. Matthew chapter 18 gives us a little insight into that as you approach someone else who's living in sin. Matthew put it pretty straight. He said in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 18, he said, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Be straight up with him, in other words. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Verse 16 says, But if he does not listen, he doesn't say give up, go home, forget about it. That's not what he says. He says, But take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And then there's a third step. He says, If he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So there's a right way of doing it, and that's hard to say in the modern day church because accountability is not something that's talked about in the modern day church very much. 
Sometimes in the modern day church, it's attend a worship service, let's fellowship together, and there's not a lot of discipleship like we were talking about before. There's not a lot of accountability, but that's not the model that we're given in the Scripture. But there's also this understanding that it's done in a spirit of gentleness. This is not a judgmental thing. In 2 Thessalonians 3.15, Paul was talking to the church at Thessalonica, and he said, Do not regard the person you're confronting as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. It's done in a spirit of love. It's not a one-up. It's not to say, hey, look at the sin you're in. You better get that straight, and I'm better than you. I I don't do that. You know, why do you? It's not that. It's, hey, Jesus has got a better plan for you. Jesus has got a better life for you. This is crippling you. This is, this is causing you not to be the man or the woman that God's called you to be. You're not being the dad or the mom you're supposed to be. You're not being the child you're supposed to be. You're not being the leader you're supposed to be. There's two things that in the last part of verse 1 that I think kind of stand out. Um, and I want you to notice them. Part of it, it says that you who are spiritual are supposed to do this. It does not mean you who are perfect. Okay, there's no perfect person. Nobody, Jesus is the only perfect one. You, you look in the context of the Scripture, if you go back to chapter 5 of Galatians, sometimes it's tough to pull, like say, let's turn to Galatians chapter 6 and not understand the context of what Paul was talking about. But if you look in chapter 5, the context of the Scripture, um, spiritual, it, it, it tells us that spiritual people are spirit-led people. It's people that are counting on God and trusting the Spirit that leads them uh, in their lives. People who are walking in the Spirit of God. They have real evidence. It's talk, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Notice the end of Galatians chapter 5. It, right before we get to the Scripture we're looking at today. And it, it says these are the kind of people who are putting on Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. We don't have this on the screen, but it, but it says these are the kind of people that are putting on love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. That's, that's who he's talking about. These are the, and he's saying these are the kind of people that when you see someone in sin, these are the people that ought to go and say God's got a better way for you doesn't mean perfect people. It means people growing in faith. And also, it speaks of doing it with gentleness. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, gentleness means doing that in a spirit of love. Doing it in, in a spirit of love. Love is the cornerstone of Christianity. Um, Jesus said that the greatest commandments were to love Him and to love others as we love Him. But listen, sometimes love is tough. Sometimes love doesn't mean comforting and making a person feel okay when they're living in dangerous sin in their life. Sometimes love means truth. Sometimes love means revealing truth. That's exactly how Christ has loved us. Truth bearers, servants. And if we don't approach it as the way Paul tells us, then I think we we put the church on on dangerous ground. Um, it can become a virus and a, and a cancer to us. So, so we can't be people. What I'm trying to say with all this is we can't be people that go to others and say, I can't believe she did that. I can't believe he did that. I would never do that. I don't know. We're all sinners and we've fallen short of the glory of God. You would have. You have before. I have too. So this is not about judging others. Who's the ultimate judge? God. Jesus Christ is the ultimate judge. He does the judging, but God gives us discernment to go to others and to help them. And, and so we, we have to do that in that spirit. We don't want to stand by and let a person be defeated and destroyed without trying to help. Um, we don't want to be like the scribes and the Pharisees who just talked about helping others, but they never really did. Matthew 23, verse 4 says, They bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with their finger. We don't want to be that kind of people. We don't want to be that church. We don't want to say, hey, this is what you ought to do, this is what you ought to do, this is what you ought to do, and never be the people that actually go to someone and say, God's got a better way. God's got a better way. They bind heavy burdens hard to bear, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with their finger. People that are living in sin need our help. Paul had already said, restore them in verse 1. 
Um, and and he, goes, he goes deeper with this. John Piper said this. He said, Wouldn't it be great to belong to a family of believers who loved each other so much that they simply could not look the other way while a brother or sister hardens into a habit of sin? Let's be that family. If we are not, we do not fulfill the law of Christ. Now, all that being said, the rest of the Scripture, just very quickly this morning, shows us that there is also a danger in that. We've got to do this the right way. There's a danger when we confront others, and it's the danger of pride. If you're taking notice, it's the danger of pride. In confronting others with sin, which is the biblical command, we, we have to remember that it's easy to become consumed by pride when we do that. It's easy to say, look at what they did. It's easy to slip into the same sins and become people of judgment. Um, if, so the Scripture is very clear about this. If we are seeking after God and we see a fellow believer living in sin, don't be afraid to confront them. That's biblical. Um, Isaiah 51, verses 12 and 13 is great Scripture. It says, I, I am He that comforts you. Who are you that you're afraid of man who dies? of the Son of Man who's made like grass and have forgotten the Lord your Maker who stretched out the heavens. We should not be afraid of going to other people and confronting them in a loving manner, in a non-prideful manner, in dealing with sin. Now, keep the verses in mind. Let's, let's look at the, the last part of this. Verses 4 and 5, as it, as it goes on. It's, it's not comparing your sin with someone else's sin. It's not... Um, I'm better than him. It's not, I'm better than her. It's about gauging our own lives and then saying God's got a better standard. It's about being accountable Christians. And so I want to just real quickly here as we end, I want to talk about some dangers, some things that can happen as we step into accountability. Okay, and we need to avoid these. The dangers of accountability. And, we, and I put these on your newsletter. We'll put them, we'll put them on the screen. When we're holding others accountable as the church, here's what we have to be aware of. Um, we have to be, be, uh, be very careful to think, not to think that when we're helping someone else that spiritual growth becomes about what I don't do. Nobody has ever grown spiritually by focusing on what they don't do, if, if that makes sense. Holiness, what I'm trying to say is that holiness is not simply just stop doing these certain sins. Um, let, me, let me kind of bring it home to mama. You know, you know, you can't say, well, I don't drink, so I'm holy. You know, that makes me a good Christian. You can't say, well, I don't, you know, I don't do what that person does, so that makes me a good Christian. Spiritual growth cannot become about what I don't do. And we got to flip that around. We begin to not do the things that God says not to do because we love Him and because we are saved and because of the grace that He has shown us. You can't just stop doing certain things and then that makes you, you know, look good in God's eyes and then you're, and God sees you as, as good. That's not transformation. Transformation is saved by grace through faith with Jesus Christ and then it changes, begins to change the things that you want to do because you want to honor God. Second thing is this, another danger in accountability, is that spiritual growth... Um, can become something that I achieve through grit and determination. Um, and we can't get to that point. In other words, you can't, you could give all the grit, and you should have grit. You should have determination. You should desire to grow. But that's not going to fix everything. It's not going to fix everything. In other words, uh, uh, you know, uh, someone that's not spiritually in tune with God could try all they want to. And if you're not relying on God's grace, then it just works. It just works. Um, so it can't happen like that. Spiritual growth can, can be, sometimes can be, become something that we achieve through grit and determination. And then the third thing, um, and this is the big one, we as the church cannot be trained to monitor love, uh, to see love as monitoring each other. In other words, we, we go to others in a spirit of love, okay, but love is founded through Jesus Christ. You know, we, can't, we can't try to love each other through monitoring each other all the time. In other words, you know, we can't keep our eyes on this person all the time and think, well, you know, I must love Jesus more because look at what they're doing. Um, so it's not about that either. It's not about judging. 
It's about helping. It's about friendships and trust and growth. Now, the last thing I want to say this morning is that in every seat this morning, um, I live, I, we put a sheet, and I want to challenge you to take that. I'm not going to take the time to go through it this morning, but it's a list of accountability questions. And uh, it's a little bit different than, than some things I normally do when I'm preaching, but there's a list of accountability questions, and I won't go through them, but I want to challenge you as a church to take them and, and just dig through them this week. Maybe take it every day and reread them every day, and it's going to ask you some questions like, how is your relationship with God right now? Um, what's my thought life like? Where am I at spiritually? Those kind of things. And, and I do want you to notice um, the quote at the bottom. It says, Too often we confuse love with permissiveness. It's not love, is it not love to fail to dissuade another believer from sin any more than it is love to fail to take a drink away from an alcoholic or matches away from a baby? True fellowship out of love for one another demands accountability. So, all that being said, this is a piggy tail on, on, the, on the back uh, side of the message from two weeks ago when we talked about confronting sin in our lives. We as the church have the responsibility to hold one another accountable, to approach others and say, God's got a better way. God's got a better way than, than for you to live in the sin. And then how do we receive that? It's not about judgment. It's about holding one another accountable. Listen, we're going to sing one more song before we go. Haley, if you, uh, if y'all want to come and lead us. And so here's the invitation um, for this morning. I want to challenge you uh, to ask yourself, what sins are holding me back? I'm going to be honest. I want to be honest with God. What sins are there right now? What sins are holding me back? What is keeping me out of fellowship with God? What's keeping me from being the man or the woman that God's called me to be? Um... And then ask yourself, what would I do if somebody said, hey, I see this in your life. Maybe it's hidden right now, but how would, you, how would you deal with it? And then step back and understand that God already knows. That God already knows uh, what the sin is. Uh, so we invite you to come. If y'all would stand with us, we're going to sing together. If you don't know Christ as your Savior this morning, I would invite you uh, to come. If you'd like to talk with someone about that, we're always here. We're always available uh, to talk with you and tell you what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. If you need to come and pray, there are folks here that will pray with you. Um, if, you need to, uh, if you need to just come and get alone with God and confess some things before the Lord, then this is a perfect time to do it. It's a great time. We just invite you to come. Let's sing together and worship together, okay?